Okay, here's one question we get uh, we get quite often. Look, Doc, you want you want us to take this vaccine, but how did how was this vaccine produced so quickly? I mean, how can you say it's safe when it comes out so fast? A couple of things are really important to understand. Absolutely, most vaccines will take years and years to come to market. Why did this vaccine come out so quickly? Okay, so a couple of things. Even before the vaccine was tested, remember, there was no shortage of money for this vaccine, right? A pandemic was happening. People open up the vaults. That's not the case for most uh, uh, um, drug and vaccine research, right? Uh, two, remember that our mRNA technology. Um, it was it was being looked at for years and years and years. It was being used for some very obscure vaccines. The technology was available. Um, it was ready to be primed. And when the technology is available, really, it's like putting a code in. You put in the code for the 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 nucleic acid sequence for the, the the code of the virus. You plug it in, and then the vaccine can be produced very quickly. Remember, this vaccine was identified in China at the end of uh, uh, 2019, early 2020, uh, and very quickly China was able to outline the nucleic acid sequence and and shared it uh, globally, right? And uh, so once that was available, it was very easy to produce the vaccine. What about testing? Well, a few things happen with testing that is really important. One, there's no shortage of volunteers. So volunteers really can take weeks to months. Um, those huge trials with 30 to 40,000 people. Remember, most vaccine trials are seven to 8,000 people. So these are much bigger trials than what's, uh, what we usually see with vaccines. Um, no shortage of getting volunteers, no shortage of illness. Right? So you remember how we do those trials, we give half the people um, an injection that's not uh, the COVID vaccine, half the people get the COVID vaccine and we follow them. So the more cases you have, the easier it is to see a difference between those two groups. And a lot of these trials took place in, in uh, countries where uh, the pandemic was raging, the US, the UK, South Africa. Uh, so in, in one sense, it was really easy to see the difference. When you have a 95% difference between the group that got the vaccine and the group that didn't, um, you know, it's easy to identify. But I think that the reason that these vaccines came to market so quickly is that the bureaucracy was eliminated. So most of the times you'll do one stage of the trial, you write it up, you send it to, you know, the, the vaccine, in this case, Health Canada, they look at it, they send questions back, you answer the questions. Um, all of that was eliminated. The, the vaccine licensing bodies and the manufacturers were in constant communication. So they had data as it was being produced, their questions were being sent back. So uh, you know the, the, the manufacturers were able to speak to it. Uh, remember, we bought vaccines before they were even tested, right? Just to show you how different this process is. So I think the important thing to remember, funding was in place, the mRNA technology was in place, the genetic sequence was, was available, uh, there was international collaboration, but most importantly, there was an efficient review process. So the bureaucratic craziness was, was eliminated um, not the safety aspects of, of the trial. So I think we can be reassured. These are big trials. Uh, the, the numbers are huge. And in many ways, um, you know, the question for me is why can't we do this more often instead of waiting four or five years for uh, a vaccine or, or medication to come to market? Okay, were the vaccines tested in diverse populations? This is always an issue, right? Like, um, you know, if studies are done in one particular group, uh, there's always a question of how applicable this is to others. So this is the data from the Pfizer and Moderna trials. You'll see about 80% of people were white, uh, about 10% were black or African American. Now, these are categories from their trial data. This, this isn't my vocabulary. Four or 5% were Asian, and uh, you'll see uh, uh, over 20% were Hispanic. Of course, this adds up to more than 100% because some people will define uh, themselves into two groups. Um, so, you know, and this is not atypical of the populations in which uh, these vaccines were studied. So this is very similar to what we were seeing in the United States. Um, and remember, the vaccines were equally effective in people of different races and ethnic backgrounds. So that's very reassuring. When we look at the AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson trial, similar. Um, I think the Johnson Johnson trial had more people who were uh, Black or African American, 17%. This is predominantly because they had a fairly robust arm of their trial in South Africa. Uh, but you can see that uh, the that relatively diverse population. Johnson Johnson also had a Latin American arm to their trial. You see 45% of uh, people define themselves as being Hispanic or Latinx. So, so fairly robust, which is reassuring. Okay, what's in the vaccines? What are we actually injecting into our arms? Um, so what's in the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer-Moderna vaccine? So 
Of course, there's the mRNA, which is really the, the component of the vaccine that triggers the immune response. And then there's this, there's fats, salts, sugars, and water. Now, for you biochemists, if you, if you remember back to your biochemistry training, if you had one, and this would not be me, uh, there's, these are the names of the fats and the salts. Um, I draw your attention to this one in particular, polyethylene glycol, all right? And we'll circle back, what we often call PEG. Um, and uh, this is with Moderna. And you can see, sorry, the first one was Pfizer. This is Moderna. Again, same thing, fat, salt, sugar, and water. And again, we've highlighted this polyethylene glycol, okay? And we'll circle back. Um, what about the other ones, the viral vector vaccines, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson? Um, there is this, the, the actual component itself, which is inside uh, a different virus, the modified adenovirus, we call it. Uh, and that's really the carriage. That's what carries uh, the uh, vaccine to our cells. And then there's all these non-medicinal ingredients, again, salts and acid stabilizers, emulsifiers, sugar, water. It sounds like my diet, actually. And, and, and if you, again, want to break it down to individual components, and I will draw your attention to this, this polysorbate 80. Okay, so uh, polyethylene glycol and polysorbate 80. Uh, and then Johnson Johnson, the same thing. You see that polysorbate 80. And really, uh, besides the medicinal ingredient, it's, uh, it's a lot of very common stuff. Why those two components? Well, the polyethylene glycol, um, it's the one thing that's in those mRNA vaccines that we know can produce an allergic response, right? But interestingly, polyethylene glycol is incredibly common. So uh, we use it in laxatives and bowel preparation. If you're ever unfortunate enough to have had a colonoscopy, this we often will give polyethylene glycol to clear out your bowels. Uh, it's often uh, seen in, in many laxatives. And it's also used in cosmetic products and a lot of over-the-counter medications, including some Tylenol formulations, uh, Benadryl, Go uh, Reactin, Advil, not all, but some of them. So there's a good chance many of us have been exposed to polyethylene glycol. If you know you have a severe allergy to polyethylene glycol, this is one of the few reasons why you shouldn't, uh, why you should talk to your clinician before you get that first dose of vaccine. In 25 years of practice, I've never seen anyone who's had uh, an allergic reaction to polyethylene glycol. Never, never heard of anyone who's had it. I don't think it's common, but if for some reason someone knows they're allergic to it, uh, that's one of the triggers. Same thing with those, those the AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson virus uh, vaccines. They, there's something they call polysorbate 80. Now, what is that? So that's, again, one thing that's known to cause allergic reactions. But again, it's really widespread, right? Uh, it's used in many food products, including ice cream. So I know I've had it, uh, you know, gum, um, certain cosmetic product, products, and it's actually used in the flu vaccine, right? So these are all potential culprits for causing an allergic reaction. Um, but again, many of us have been exposed to these things and, and don't really know it. What is not in the vaccine? Okay, there's no food products. So if I have a nut allergy or I'm allergic to seafood or whatever it is, not an issue getting the vaccine, okay? There's no antibiotics. So if I have a penicillin allergy or I'm allergic to sulfur drugs or whatever, not a problem getting the vaccine. There's no thimerosal. So there's people who worry about mercury in the vaccine, not an issue. There's no formaldehyde. There's a lot of concern in some communities about uh, fetal cells, right? That uh, uh, where are these vaccines produced uh, using um, fetal cells, not an issue with these vaccines. Uh, and then of course, you probably all heard this, this concern about microchips being injected into us. And uh, you know, there, I, there are no microchips. I can say if anyone wants to follow me, my phone is on all the time. Uh, you know, anyone can find me at any point in time. There's probably easier ways to, to monitor me than microchips, but this is some of the misinformation we've, uh, we've run into. Um, what do you do if you have a pre-existing allergy? Look, the good news is you're not going to get vaccinated in a place where there isn't someone there to deal with allergies, right? If you know you have a severe allergy, what we're telling people is stay 30 minutes. We know the vast majority of severe allergies will happen in the first 30 minutes. Um, and there will be medical staff around, right? No matter where you get this vaccine uh, so that it can deal with severe allergies. It is incredibly rare, right? Incredibly rare. So... I think we can be reassured. Um, when do we need to take caution? If you know you have a severe allergy to PEG, or, um, which again, I've never run into, uh, then speak to your healthcare worker. Uh, if you've had a severe allergy to the first dose, then you wanna, you wanna certainly speak to your healthcare worker before you get the second dose. Okay, what's happening after receiving the vaccine? Many of you have heard that the Center for Disease Control in the United States has said that if I have had my two doses of vaccines, 
I would be able to be in contact with other people who've had two doses of vaccine without using a mask. Now, we're not saying that in Canada as yet, okay? Um, so really, if you've had the vaccine here, right now, nothing changes. You still want to be very, very careful uh, around other people. Uh, you want to wear a mask. You want to keep your distance. You want to wash your hands. You want to stay at home as much as possible, whether you're vaccinated or you're not vaccinated. But when enough of us get the vaccine, right? This, to me, this is the way out. Uh, and as enough of us get us back, get the vaccine, as those numbers come down, as they have in Israel and in the UK, um, we are certainly hoping that we'll be able to spend more time with other people who are vaccinated, uh, even without masks, right? Uh, to me, this is the way out.